Show us a miracle, the crowd demanded of Jesus. That's the world's mindset even today. Jesus, who had healed the blind, the cripples, and even raised a little girl and his friend Lazarus from the dead, was in no mood to entertain doubting skeptics. Jesus said the only sign he'd give to a wicked and adulterous generation was the sign of Jonah the prophet. Jonah was a type of the resurrection, raised up after three days of confinement in the belly of the giant fish. Even now, many people are entirely ignorant of what God's doing prophetically to prepare us for the return of Jesus. If you want to put your doubts to rest today, we're going to take you to one of the most remarkable places on earth, the very point where God's tabernacle and the Ark of the Covenant rested for 369 years. We're going to ancient biblical Shiloh in central Israel, where archaeologists are uncovering earth-shattering discoveries. What's being uncovered are important prophetic signs, signs that mercifully confirm biblical history and give credence to the truth of this book. The Jerusalem Channel is made with the support of you, our viewers. Thank you for watching. Shalom, I'm Christine Dark. Think about this. Generations of believers have lived and died without witnessing any of the end time signs prophesied in the Bible. Yet our current generation is witness to so many of them. Wars, earthquakes, pestilences, and most of all, the super sign of the rebirth of modern Israel and the recapture of their ancient capital, Jerusalem, by the Jews. Yet on top of all of these spectacular signs, Biblical archaeology day by day is confirming the validity of the Bible and sending warnings as well to this generation through their discoveries. For example, recently we produced a video on the discovery of an ancient iron curse tablet that was sifted out of rubble from Joshua's altar on Mount Ebal in biblical Samaria. Not only did the ancient tablet contain the proto-Hebrew name for God, but it was a timely reminder as a curse tablet that the world should know God expects obedience. And the discovery corroborates the biblical account in the Torah when the Jewish people entered into a covenant with God to obey his law, to receive either his blessings for obedience or cursings for disobedience. Recently, we interviewed the head of the archaeological team that discovered the curse tablet, Dr. Scott Stripling. And also, we interviewed a member of his team, Frankie Snyder, an American Israeli who specializes in Herodian decorative tiles. And she has put together, like a jigsaw puzzle, the fragments of the temple tiles that Jesus and his disciples walked upon. Now, both Dr. Stripling and Frankie Snyder are digging in biblical Shiloh, and they're making significant discoveries concerning the actual location of the biblical tent of worship called in Hebrew, the Mishkan. Today in the world, there must be hundreds, if not thousands of churches named Shiloh, borrowing their biblical name from this ancient hillside town in central Israel. After Joshua's conquest over the Canaanites, Shiloh, as it's pronounced in Hebrew, became the center of Jewish worship. Dr. Stripling walked us through the largest excavation in Israel, and at one point we were privileged to stand by the area where he believes the ancient Holy of Holies once stood, a walled area that fits the biblical dimensions of the tabernacle and where there's a large nearby deposit of bones from sacrificial animals. There are plenty of famous Israeli archaeologists so I asked Scott Stripling why he, as an American, is allowed to bring his large team and his archaeological innovations to Israel. 
He also shared with us details about the uncovering of the Mishkan location, as well as how the discovery of the cursed tablet was a 10 on a scale of 1 to 10 in the archaeological world. First of all, welcome to Tel Shilo. Glad to have you here uh, today. You can see behind us our team is working away and they're uh, very inspired because they're in fascinating contexts, excavating around a monumental building that we think could likely relate to the Mishkan, to the tabernacle and the sacrificial system that uh, was exposed here. So at Shiloh itself, we have a number of things from that time period, like storage buildings, we have um, ceramic palm granites that are a motif of the tabernacle. The priests wore these on the hem of their garments. We have altar horns from, obviously there was an altar in this area. We have a destruction layer that's apparently relating to the Philistine destruction of Shiloh. And then this large monumental building that's orienting east-west, divided in ratios of two to one. And then in area D on the western edge of the site, we have a favisa or a bone deposit that's full of late Bronze Age pottery and thousands of bones, kosher animals, only from the biblical sacrificial system. Two thirds of those bones are from the right side of the animal, one third are from the left side of the animal. So all of this inductively is giving us a picture of what life was like in the tabernacle period at Shiloh. Dr. Scott Stripling's career as an innovative archaeologist is inspired by his faith. He's director of the Archaeology Institute at the Bible Seminary in Katy, Texas. But with so many regional archaeologists already exploring the Holy Land, how did the door open for his large team of associates to excavate ancient Shiloh? Psalm, Psalm 102, 14 is one of my favorite verses. Blessed are those who love your dust and cherish your stones. And so for me, it is a privilege and my team feels the same way. Um, we had been working here for many years in Israel. We've built strong relationships. We've done good work. We've published well. And because of that, the doors have opened up for us to be here at this amazing place. And like Jeremiah 7, 12 says, go now to Shiloh where I first caused my name to dwell, see what I did and make it known. And so that's my goal, is to reveal what happened here in antiquity. In the past, leftover debris at excavation sites has generally been discarded. But here at Shiloh, the project has added extra steps and precautions when sifting through the former debris to search for priceless small objects. And archeology span is very high tech but it's also very low tech. You know, we have human beings physically down in squares, moving soil, making decisions, making notes, removing material, examining it. On the other hand, it's very high tech. You know, we're, we're sampling, we're doing chemical testing on soil and on, even on rocks. Yesterday we had acid on site where we were applying it to rocks because if it's limestone, it will fizz. And, you know, so we're using the sciences, the hard and soft sciences. We fly a drone at the end of the day and take hundreds of shots. Those images then feed into a photogrammatic software that gives us 3D images. We're wet sifting down below in this state-of-the-art uh, station that I just showed you. There's an infield lab with infrared and ultraviolet lighting. Throughout the day, we've got geologists and numismatists and, and uh, anthropologists and zoo archaeologists that are interacting with our team throughout that day. So really fascinating the, to see how we process the material. The previous discovery of the now famous curse tablet from sorting over debris from Joshua's altar had brought many wonderful surprises to Scott and his team. And my goal was to demonstrate what we're throwing away. Because in the past, Christine, we've been throwing away about 75% of the evidence in the small finds. And I knew this because I'd already done, done probes. For every one scarab we used to find, we now find four. For every one bula we used to find, we now find four. So I knew from the dump piles that I wanted to publish this to the academic community to say basically, hey, methodologically, we can't keep doing it the way we're doing it. Uh, you only get one chance as an archaeologist. We can't go back and repeat the experiment. We're destroying the evidence when we excavate and making it inaccessible to others. So we've got to do it differently. So that was my goal of the project. Well, in the meantime of sifting the material at Mount Ival, we found this small folded lead tablet. And that tablet, I knew it immediately, was a cursed tablet. Frankie Snyder was the member of my staff. It was four, 
uh, fortuitously in her tray and she recognized it, she showed it to me and we started jumping up and down because we both knew what it was. It's a curse tablet. And Mount Ebal is the mountain of the curse. Hundreds of these have been found in Israel in different contexts. So it's, it's a known quantity called a defixio. I thought immediately, these are more common in later period, like second temple period, for example, uh, but it's in a first temple context. Um, so I was warning our team, this is awesome, but it probably is a later pilgrim who came along and, you know, left it there remembering that it was Joshua's altar. So when we were able to scan the lead at a, a lab in Prague and we began to see the first letters, I was in shock. The cursed tablet discovery has forced some profound re-evaluations by the academic community. The tablet synchronizes with the account of the covenant renewal ceremony in Joshua chapter 8, and it proves that there was an alphabetic script for Moses and Joshua to write the earliest biblical books. I thought, this is late Bronze Age text. It's when the alphabet was first forming out of Egypt. You take the hieroglyphs and they begin to have phonetic qualities. So it's a known quantity. It's been called proto-Canaanite, proto-Sinaitic. Nobody wants to call it proto-Hebrew. But until now, we can't call it anything but that because in this inscription we have the name of God. You have Yahweh or Yahu, yod Hevav twice in the inscription. So I was just uh, really elated but also in shock because we were seeing the word Arur, which is curse, repeatedly. A curse tablet from the mountain of the curse on a curse, uh, in a curse situation was just astonishing. So um, I never wanted to be known as the curse guy. I've always wanted to be a blessing, but you know, really it's a synchronism between the archeological data and the biblical text. Um, all we've ever found are curse tablets. It's part of a covenant. This is how you make covenants. So the blessings of the covenant were pronounced from Mount Gerizim, the curses from Mount Eval. It's judicial, it's legally binding. And I think it's a titular document, like one person on behalf of the nation is binding them to it. And for your, your viewers, this is, I think, very meaningful because the tablet is on the mountain of the curse in an altar. Where do we need an altar? Not on Mount Gerizim. We need an altar on Mount Eval, the place of the curse. Because when, through sin, we fracture our relationships with God and with each other, it's through sacrifice that we're able to restore those. Even though I'm guilty of those curses, cursed, 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 cursed are you by the God Yahweh, okay? Eventually, I'm going to break the, the law, and I'm going to be guilty. But if I'll go to the altar, those curses don't inure to me. Those curses are for the one who will not accept responsibility, will not seek restitution and repentance. The Shiloh excavation has required archaeological skills in one hand and the Bible in the other. Many secular scholars have argued that the Bible could not have been written when it was purported to have been written because they had no alphabet with which to write and these early Israelites, or as some would call them proto-Israelites, weren't literate. They could not read and write. We now have clear evidence that early Israelites, at least some of them, probably many of them, were literate. They could read, they could write, and we have words that are directly from the Torah on this tablet. So it, it shifts the ground fundamentally from those who have tried to minimize the text and say, well, it was written in the Persian period or the Hellenistic period. That, that's no longer feasible in my view. The challenge facing archaeologists today is how to bridge the narratives of the Bible with our own understanding of the land of Israel in the 21st century. Scott's passion is connecting the material culture of the Holy Land with the biblical text. In this part of the world, the Bible is our go-to source. And uh, there's not a day that goes by that we're not referring to the biblical text. Shiloh's not mentioned in Mesopotamian literature. It's not mentioned in Egyptian literature. It's only mentioned in the Bible. And if someone presupposes that the Bible is not a reliable source, then they're going to discount the most valuable data that they could have. On the, I, on the other hand, take the, the text and take the archaeological material and try to understand the dialogue between them, like we were talking about earlier with the references to the Mishkan and so forth. So it is a, a field that has a lot of secular influence, 
but there are many scholars who are coming to see that you can't really do archaeology here without an understanding and awareness of the Bible. I was a biblical studies major. Um, the, the Bible was a big part of my life and knew it well, read it daily, and I was a bit frustrated by the things that were difficult to understand. And I had a sense that they must have to do with a lack of understanding of the material culture, it's that, that distance of thousands of years and the, the metaphors, the figures of speech. And that led me you know, down a, down a path where I began to consume everything I could get a hold of. Eventually I started vol volunteering on archeological digs, went back to school and did another graduate program, eventually a PhD in ancient Near Eastern archeology span and kind of worked my way through the ranks, you know, um, till eventually, as they say, the inmates were in charge of the asylum. And uh, so I'm, I'm really privileged to be able to do what I'm doing now. Well, to continue our archaeology special, we had the chance to meet Frankie Snyder, who had the distinction of actually finding a proverbial needle in a haystack, the now famous cursed tablet from Mount Ebal. As we were sifting it, we found pieces of flint, were flint tools, a lot of flint tools. And if you were doing sacrifices up there, you needed the flint tools. But then one day on my tray, there was this little piece, you know, like this big, and at first it looked like a pottery shard. It was the thickness of pottery, and it was a rectangular chunk, like a piece of pottery. But when I picked it up, I realized that it was much heavier than what pottery should be, and I realized that it was lead. I've worked with lead at other sites, and so you are aware of the, the weight of materials, and this was sort of like, whoa, this thing is heavy. <clears throat> so I washed it off some more, and then I could see on the side of it uh, where it had been folded over. So you had a top layer and then a bottom layer. And you could see this line going around three sides of it. So I knew then that it was a tablet. And it was folded over on the fourth side. And it wasn't randomly folded, just kind of flopped over like this. It was very accurately done so that it was purposely folded in half to hide what was on the inside of it. So I washed off the outside and then I took it over to Scott and I said, Scott, I've got something special for you. And he said, what is it? And I said, a lead tablet. At about that point, he about had a heart attack. <laughs> Not really, but he was so surprised because we kind of joked about, what would it be like if we could find a lead curse tablet on the mountain of curses? And there it was, it was in our hand. And so um, we washed it off there. Uh, it was later taken to one of the top um, conservators here in Israel, Orna Cohen. And she took a good look at it and she was gonna to try to see, we told her to make one attempt to see if it w might be possible to open it. And so she tried in one tiny little corner and it kind of just flaked apart. And she said, that's it, no way, we can't do this. <clears throat> but the advantage of having that tiny little piece flake off was that one of the specialists in uh, metallurgy at Hebrew University was able to take it and figure out where the lead actually came from. And it turns out that it comes from a quarry in Greece that was known to have been used in the Middle Bronze Age period. So having that tiny little piece was very significant. Of course, then our problem was, so how do you read this thing? Um, you can't open it, so you need to be able to scan through it someplace. But this isn't like scanning through paper or scanning through wood. This is scanning through lead. And if when you go to the hospital and you need an x-ray, what do they put over you to protect you during x-ray scans? Lead. So the question was, is it possible to do it? And who can do this? And Scott was able to find um, a person in, or a lab there in Prague, who knew how to scan through lead. And when they began to scan through it and then do the post-production part, and all of a sudden these very, very ancient Hebrew letters started popping up on it, it was like, whoa, this is really, really important. It was in the debris from an earlier excavation of Joshua's altar on Mount Ebal that Scott Stripling's team member, Frankie Snyder, uncovered the extraordinary Bible-confirming cursed tablet. We weren't really looking for a cursed tablet. We were looking for anything to help show that this is a Middle Bronze Age site. This is a site that dates back to the time of Joshua. We know in um, Deuteronomy chapters 27 and 28, it talks about the mountain of the blesses, the mountain of the curses, and the back and forth, almost like litany that was going on between all the different tribes. But to show that this place 
is the altar that Joshua built that we're told about, talked about, that's talked about in Joshua 8, we would need something to authenticate it. And Zertal had found pottery that goes back to that time, but that was it. So being able to find something else, even just that material was important, but even more so the writing that was on that material, which turned out to be a tablet. So we were just trying to find anything that helped to authenticate that this was Joshua's altar, or this was an altar that was used by Israelites back that far back in time. Because there's so many people that think, ah, oh, this Israelite community who has this monotheistic God called Yahweh, were they really here at this time? And once the, the tablet was read, it was like, wow, here we have a tablet with writing. The writing is that ancient. The material of the tablet is that ancient. The pottery in that area is that ancient. And it has on this tablet the name of God, the yud He vav name that was used by the Israelites for their monotheistic God. And it puts it all back into that one time period, which is absolutely amazing. The Temple Mount Sifting Project is a salvage operation begun in 2004, and its aim is the recovery and study of archaeological artifacts contained within debris removed from Jerusalem's Temple Mount. That debris had been dumped without any proper archaeological oversight. Amongst the treasures uncovered were fragments of the decorated floor tiles from the time of King Herod. Frankie Snyder tells me that as a mathematician, she was able to restore 2,000-year-old tile fragments into what Herod's floor would have looked like in the temple in his lifetime. Um, back in the 1980s, this is going to go ways back, back in the 1980s, I actually figured out that I was Jewish. We were being raised as Polish Catholic. I knew I had Jewish relatives, but I was told we were not Jewish. In the middle, uh, beginning of the 1980s, I actually figured out I was Jewish, and I felt like I needed to go to Israel. Not that day, that year, whatever. I needed to eventually get to Israel. There was something important that I needed to do. There was something that was waiting for me here. Um, once my children were grown on their own, I decided to make Aliyah in 2007. I got here and it's like, okay, so what can I do? I, got, I was preparing to take my old pond classes. And I thought I'll do that for the first year, but I had a couple weeks to spare before that started. So I heard about this Temple Mount Sifting Project right in the middle of Jerusalem. I could hop on a bus and go out there for the day. So I did that. I liked what they were doing. So I told them I'd like to volunteer for about three weeks. Um, and I started the next day as a volunteer. The second day I was there, I found four coins. They figured out I knew what I was, <laughs> I knew how to look for things within this material. Um, so two weeks later, I was hired. So I'd been in the country less than a month and I had a paying job, which is very strange for people who come over here not already being in a paying job when you arrive. <clears throat> um, one of the areas that I was working in, we were finding a lot of these geometric shaped tiles. And so I asked the archeologist on duty one day, is anyone working with these tiles trying to reconstruct the floors that they came from? And she said, no, right now we're collecting them, we're documenting them, we're putting them into our collection, but if you'd like to give it a try, go right ahead. And I said, well, I have a math degree. I really like geometry. Sure, I'll give it a try. And that was the beginning of it. It was by looking at these tiles and trying to figure out, you know, which ones are from the Herodian period, because we realized that some of them were from later in the Byzantine period, some were Crusaders, some were Islamic. So I began to study different floors around the city, both by looking at pictures and by going to buildings all over the place, to try to figure out the different sorts of tiles we might have. And then specifically for the Herodian ones, I began to visit the Herodian palaces. And by looking at the floors that were left in the Herodian palaces, or the remnants of these kind of tiles. The kind of tile is called opus sectilla. The opus means work, sectilla is cut. So these are cut and work stones. I began to look at all the different floors in the palaces to determine what were Herod's rules of construction. What did he want? What was he asking for? How did the colors alternate? What sizes were being used? And that way I could actually pull out from our collection from the Temple Mount the ones that I thought specifically were from the Temple Mount. I mean, were from the time of King Herod. And then by matching up the tiles to the different type of patterns that were used in Herod's palaces, 
I was able to do reverse engineering and go back and put these tiles together. So it was something from my math background from many years before, but it was like, wow, is this what God had me preparing to do all those years in loving geometric patterns that I could come here then and help reconstruct the floors that were on the, on the Temple Mount in the late Second Temple period. For Christians, this is the, these are the floors that Jesus walked on when he was there. For the Jews, these are the floors that their ancestors walked on when they came up to the Temple Mount for the Shlosh Regalim, for the three holidays during the year. So it was absolutely amazing to be able to accomplish that. And it's like those tiles have been sitting there for 2,000 years waiting for me to show up on the spot or for a mathematician to show up there because the archaeologists weren't sure how to do it because they seemed to have no context. But you could actually go back and work it out, figure it out. But it was a job for a mathematician, not for a standard archaeologist to do. It's amazing that in the 21st century, we have the actual evidence of that ancient cursed tablet to reinforce the truth of the Bible. The discovery of the cursed tablet confirms to us that an altar was necessary on Mount Ebal because the people had no other option to seek the forgiveness of sins except through animal sacrifice. But today, under the new covenant, it is by grace we are saved through faith, faith in the blood of Jesus the Messiah. And this is not from ourselves. It is the gift of God, not through works. So nobody can boast. Amen. Well, if you have any comments or questions, you can contact me through social media or at our website, exploits.tv. Don't forget, download our free Jerusalem Channel app to access all our videos and our Bible reading plan. We also offer many articles and ebooks at our website on a variety of important subjects, including this one, All Eyes Riveted on the Temple Mount. And so until our next time together, I'm always going to be contending for the faith and praying earnestly for the peace of Jerusalem. Shalom, I'm Christine Dark. Maranatha. <laughs>